Hello, welcome to the Cube. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube here in Seattle with AWS is in their headquarters. The building's name is reInvent. That's ironic as reInvent's coming up. Deepak Singh is here, vice president of the next generation developer experience at AWS Cube alumni. We've talked about photography, containers, Kubernetes, and now with Q really rocking and rolling, it's hot. Good to see you. Thanks yeah, for likewise, great. Thanks for coming on theCUBE inside the AWS building, yeah. I'm inside the ropes. Last time we did this, I think, was at the reInvent show floor, so <laughs> this is a little different. We'll be at reInvent this year in the Venetian, the press area, we got a lot of interviews lined up, but it's going to be super exciting because Gen AI has really brought productivity to everybody. It's a, I just did a podcast with Dave Vellante for our weekly pod, and the title is uh, Tech Party Time, everyone's having a good time. <laughs> There's energy up and down the stack. I was talking to Dave Brown. I mean, it feels like the 90s if you're in networking and compute. And if you're in software, it's like a Cambrian explosion of new capabilities, the productivity. Just the action is off the charts. I mean, I've never yeah. seen it in my career. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I got into Gen AI a couple of years ago, and I said at the time, I think when I took over this role, I put this on LinkedIn, is the last time I felt this excited about any technology was when EC2 got launched. Uh, that was before I joined AWS, and you know, a year and a half after that I was here. This time, right in the middle of it, right from the beginning. I am convinced, and we are starting to see a lot of evidence of this, is that using generative AI is going to change the way all of us build software. It's going to make us build software faster, get more creative, spend less time doing uh, things that we don't like doing. So a lot of the way we think about a developer experience mm -hmm. with generative AI is, how can we use this phenomenal technology to unblock our developers from building software, doing the things that they like to do? Yeah, and I love your title, Next Generation Developer Experience. That's really kind of speaks what it is. And, and that's a, there's a lot in there to, to discuss. Um, and certainly I want to, and you have a unique perspective because you, you were doing all the platform engineering thinking around containers and all that stuff that was going into, into the microservices. And again, web services is a beautiful setup for Gen AI, but I want to get, I want to set it up with, with my conversation I had with Werner Vogels two days ago on the Lambda's 10th anniversary at exclusive one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one. And it was a wide ranging conversation, it was a lot of fun. Werner's also very animated. <laughs> but what was interesting is he said, you know, we, when Lambda came out, when serverless kind of came out, you didn't know what was going to happen. And there was a before and after after a moment of, of that, where you kind of were doing stuff with the cloud, but then it was growing and more stuff had to get done, and serverless just changed the game and made distributed computing happen. Um, but he talked about the PRFAQ, and I want, this is where I want to get your thoughts, because it, it made me realize like there was a moment there when you get a lot of people in the room, they go, wow. And I asked him a question, I said, so you know, you guys debate, align, and commit, that's the Amazonian way. So what was the debate like in the room when you guys are putting together the, the working backwards document for Lambda? And he goes, no one debated. They all were like, wow, this is going to be great. They kind of knew, they connected the dots. Yeah. It was all excitement because they understood what it meant. And then obviously it's historic because serverless changed the game significantly. Yeah. What's your Gen, I ver Gen, Gen AI version of that? Because I agree with you, there's a before moment where you now go, you don't got to be a rocket scientist to see all this greatness coming down yeah. the pike. What is your, what is your that moment for you? Because this is like I can see ten things. What do you see? Yeah. The dis the discussion when we started this was less about what will make this. You know, what it, that, is this going to be magical? What do we need to do? It was very clear that this was transformative. Or most of us had conviction about it. The big question we were asking each other was, what is the thing that we can do for customers that makes it useful for them today? What are the things we can do for them that makes this technology, which we know is going to keep evolving at this crazy rate, yeah. but can help them move forward today? So, in fact, the first thing that uh, the product manager on my team who wrote this up was this idea, uh, there were two ideas that came up. One, and they're both capabilities in Q Developer today. The first one was, how can we help customers diagnose issues and then under, help them understand how they can fix them? So a great example of this is this AQ developer in the AWS console. Uh, in fact, people get very hung up on talking about writing code, but actually some of the most interesting capabilities in Q developer are not about writing code. It's about understanding why your application may not be working. So you end the Lambda console and you get this error talking about Lambda. It works really well with Lambda, by the way. Uh, and using Q developer, you can figure out, and Q developer will tell you what that error is in human language, mm -hmm. so you don't have to go figure out from documentation, mm -hmm. or go somewhere online and start Googling. It'll tell you right there what it is. It'll also tell you how you can fix it. And that, it sounds very simple, but you do that 20 times a day, and suddenly you're moving that much faster. Yeah. 
So it's small things like that. The other thing that was part of the original, as we had these debates, like we like like we do, that became sort of the yes, we need to do this, is what over time became the Q agent for software development, which is, can you give an AI system a problem? And the problem could be an, like an issue in a backlog, which is I want to add a new API to this application. And what Q developer does is it goes ahead and looks at the rest of your application, sees what's there, how you've written it, comes back to you with a plan on what code needs to be written, what code needs to be deleted, what new files need to be written. And if you agree, it goes ahead and executes that autonomously on your behalf, uh, creates tests and everything, right? Uh, and those were among the first ideas that we discussed. There were many, but these were the two as we started having these debates and discussing. It was less about, oh, we have to do this. That was obvious. Yeah. What do we have to do? And these were the kinds of things that came out and it all boiled down to what are the things we can, which we can do that can help developers move faster, yeah. help them get unblocked. So those are two meaty examples. On, there's a lot of meat on the bones. Not a lot. Of, it's not just sizzle. There's a lot of stake on that. That, that yeah. those problems. It's not. Those are hard problems. They are hard problems. They are important problems. I think they can do a lot of things that look very glitzy, yeah. but very often, uh, sometimes the most useful things. In, in this case, yeah. some of them. So I guess it sounds glitzy as well. Are things that. They just help our developers. Yeah, well, I love the vision. Let's step back for a second. Give me the strategy and vision for how you're going to tra tr how you guys see uh, the transformation in software development happening. Because agents are here. You mentioned you have one. That's only going to be more. It's going to be sub agents, multiple agents. You're going to have all kinds of, you know, I just, I've been hearing conversations around LLM routing, model routing. I mean, it makes sense because you want to integrate and have a runtime, kind of a, I hate to use the word compiler, but things kind of kind of work together. You got to put code together. What is the vision? Yeah, so I, 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 the word I like to think about and the way I like to think about it is, what are the things we can do for our customers, mm -hmm. taking into account everything that we have available to us today. And that's not just the LLMs. Yeah. It's other things that we do. Uh, uh, in, the, in many ways, making LLMs useful for developers is understanding what customer pain points exist. Mm -hmm understanding what AWS can uniquely do for them that they can't necessarily just do themselves. There's a lot more to making LLMs useful for building applications than just the LLM. While acknowledging that every few months, the underlying technology, the underlying foundation models are going to get that much better. And we have taken, we have taken full advantage of that with yeah. bigger context windows, better reasoning capabilities. But I think that Ground, being grounded on the customer problem is, a, is remains the key. And I'll give you some examples. So we started simple, which was, hey, and I'm going to talk about code here, mm -hmm. is the right now what we can help customers with is helping them with auto-completion of code. That's how most coding assistants started. But code is only a small part of what developers do, so we switched our mindset to, no, we need to build develop assistants. So that evolved from just help me type faster, mm -hmm. to can I have a chat window on the side where I can ask more complex questions, where it can help me mm -hmm. with even have a debate with, is this the right way to think about this problem? Allowing you to highlight a piece of code and asking, what does this do, yeah. right? Yeah. And then continuing to evolve that, which includes building these agents that can are goal seeking, yeah. where you give it a task and it goes ahead and does it autonomously. And today we are bringing all of this together. So. You know, as recently as a month ago uh, with Q Developer, you either did autocomplete or you went to this chat window. But people want both capabilities within flow because they like what they get in the chat window and they like the flow of being able to type. <laughs> so we added this thing called inline chat where you start typing but you want to send a bigger prompt and a more complex query, taking into account all your files and all the ones that are open and you hit command I on a Mac and voila, you can send much more complex prompts through. So, and this is just one example of our develop our customers. Because you're at the point of a code coding point of attack, I would say, but like a sports analogy, but you're in the point of coding, yes. the context switching, break, or disruption. It slows down your workflow. Yeah. So our customers told us they like the workflow nature, because that's how they write code today, yeah. of uh, inline coding, but they like the richness of the chat context, so a lot of so we brought them together, you know, with inline chat, 
And uh, you know, that, that just, it's, it feels small, but it's actually quite transformational yeah. for their work. What are the partners or what other systems or partner systems or data connections do you see? Because we've been hearing a lot from, um, you know, Matt, Swami, and others on your, on your, on your uh, teammates there saying, meet, the, meet them where they are, right? I mean, they're in Slack. Well, okay, do some stuff in Slack if they're over here. Uh, if I'm using uh, Connect, I'm in a call center. I mean, the customers are doing everything in multi-modes, pun intended, not just data modes, but like they're context switching multiple tools. Yeah. They don't wake up saying, I'm in this one thing. Yeah. It's this now multi-purpose environments. Yeah, so we support many channels from an AWS context. It's the channels our customers use the most. So your IDE, which could be any IDE. It could be VS Code, it could be IntelliJ, it could be uh, a Jupyter Notebook. Uh, where you are, we want you to use our plugins. We, uh, you can use Q Developer inside Slack, for example. So you can go into Slack and say, at AWS, answer this question. Uh, in, on your own shell, like people like me still love using a shell in the CLI. You can <laughs> ask questions there. You can go into the AWS marketing website or into a documentation page and ask questions. So from an AWS customer perspective, we asked ourselves, where do they sit? And we will bring uh, QTU, but uh, yesterday you may have seen the announcement. Uh, Wiz and Datadog both announced uh, the general availability, I think, of their plugins for Amazon Q, which means you're in the AWS console and you're doing something and you have a security issue and you're a Wiz customer. Yeah. You can invoke the Wiz extension and send that query over to Wiz, where Wiz will analyze your security issue and get back to you back in the AWS console, right? So. We are doing. We are putting Q in the channels that our customers are using. Creating a trust connection between delegation of task versus some black box. Correct. That's a that's a changes the game because now you have end to end visibility. Yeah. So and over time, talking if you yeah. you know vision and strategy, you'll see many more capabilities like that from other partners mm -hmm. uh, coming into Q. There are other channels that we are exploring which will, with the idea of where do we meet the customers, where they are. Okay, so if you can look out on, on, and imagine a steady state of success with Q, you know, it doesn't have to be long term, it could be short, medium, medium, short, medium term, near future. What does it look like? I mean, do you have just kind of like voice activated code? Is it more of a, in line with the IDE? Is it enabling people to get back at the coding? I mean, how does a guy like me, who has coded in 20 years, get back in the game? I feel like I'm rusty. Is Q help me get going? I mean, what is what is it going to be? Business people, business as code versus infrastructure as code. What's uh, what's it, what's your vision there? Uh, so I'll start off with what is possible today because it draws those lines. Today you have customers like the BT Group that are using Q developer to write code. They're seeing 37% acceptance rates. There are people like the National Australia Bank that are seeing 50% acceptance rates. What that tells me is that for their developers, a significant chunk of their code is now being written using a developer assistant. Uh, you have heard the example of Amazon where we did this massive transformation of our Java code where we went from an older version of Java to Java 17. Uh, saving 4,500 developers years worth of, uh, of work, you know, and $260 million of run rate of, of cost savings. This is possible right now. Uh, the latter one is enabled by agents. Mm -hmm. Where this is going to go is that a lot of the blocking tasks, uh, like transformation of a version, are going to be handled for you by a developer assistant, by an AI system, like QDeveloper. And QDeveloper will help your developers get free time to go be creative, to go build these applications. But even there, uh, I re recently wrote an article uh, about what effectively what we were talking about is what I call specification-driven development, which is you are giving the AI system a goal. It is only the developer who understands the system, what needs to be built. So they need to have systems thinking, mm -hmm. talking about microservices and complex yeah. systems. But they don't need to know every single API call. They don't need to know every single AWS service in detail. The AI system can help them implement it in Dynamo, even if they've never used Dynamo. Yeah. But they know they need that. So kind syntax of help, that big time help. Yeah. So they so, know architecture. They yeah. can they, they can think about the system they're building, the kind, and they can give requirements to this to one of these agents, like the Q agent for software development. And the agent will then look at the specifications, collaborate with them, and then execute it autonomously. And that's happening. It's going to happen really quickly. And what we find are our customers are, in, are increasingly embracing that sort of view of the world. I want to get into that because and I want to get into also the numbers, which I thought was an error, but it's years, not <laughs> in days. Um, 
the systems thinking is huge because if you think about what you just said, okay, conceptually, to, to do a systems think, holistic architecture or solution plan and then build an architecture around it could take literally a half a year, okay, or, or just a lot of time. And then you got to like plan it out and then start coding it, test it. I mean, just the blocking and tackling, chopping wood, carrying the water to yeah. make that happen is just off the charts. Yeah. And now you can just put it together, move faster. Scope the scale of the speed there, because I think this is system thinking. Well, I think will be our generation. This waves iteration or you know design thinking. Remember the one that was, that was yeah. hot? These hot trends. You still design thinking is relevant. UX, of course, but this is a systems mindset. You yeah. understand consequences and, and how things work. And you actually can think about it at an organizational level. Even simple examples like if you are, today developers spend only some percentage of time inside the IDE because they're spending a lot of time doing other things like reading documentation, yeah. trying to debug an issue, mm -hmm. or doing a transformation. If all of that got speeded up significantly, like you mm -hmm. just heard with the Java example, that gives them more time to be creative inside the IDE, which is, I'm using that as a tool for development. And if you can speed up how much they can accomplish with that tool for development, with things like the agent for software development, you can now build more. You know, Very often you'll hear customers say, you know, like if you're a company, your customers want you to deliver more features. Uh, if you are in, uh, a bank, your customers want more products or faster banking. Uh, the ability to do that, mm -hmm. deliver more capabilities to your customers, deliver them at a the higher quality. That's what we, what AI, Gen AI is going to help you do as builders, and we're excited about that. I think about the, um, the queue has been um, getting a lot of great reviews, so congratulations. Um, there's a couple of notable things here I want to just get your thoughts on. One was the redesign, okay, for the developer agent. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned reasoning earlier. I want to, I want to talk about that, but first, um, you guys have been using it internally, which is the classic Amazonian move. You identify your own problems, and you're at scale. What was in the, in the 4,500 years of manual work, and 260 million annually? I'm, I, said, I said this morning. Did you get that right? He's like, no, it's years. I mean, obviously, it's it's man years, and you kind of do the calculations, but it's a big number. I mean. Yeah. I'm not trying to interrogate the number. It's more of the size and scope and the order of magnitude. It's like, yes. oh my God, that's like, I was thinking maybe you know, yeah. days, weeks. It's also a function of the scale of that. It's just huge. Base. Take us through what, how that happened, and then I want to jump into the kind of the redesign, some of the speed stuff you guys have been doing. Yeah, so one of the things that made it happen, and this goes into the systems thinking, it's not just some magic thing that you switch there, and you press a button and you know, yeah, pix happens. pixie dust happens. Uh, we had a really good partnership, and we've, this is what we're doing with our customers as well. It's, so it was a great learning for us, and we have applied that to our customers. Uh, where we worked with, uh, at Amazon, there's this team called the Amazon Software Builder Experience Team. Their job and mission is to enable our software builders inside the company. We worked with them to take uh, the core transformation capabilities that we had developed and integrate them into the systems the way things work inside Amazon. And so they were able to, from our end user perspective, make it very, very simple and very easy to do these transformations using, so they took what we had, they built around it, integrated into our internal systems, and that's what made, gave you that level of success. Uh, some of it is due to the scale of our internal code base, second, and you know, Java 17 is that much more efficient than Java 8, which is where the dollar savings come from. So, yeah, and we were able to measure it because we were we, yeah. we happened to have those measurements. I mean, some people call it hygiene, some people call it you know cleanliness, data cleaning, code cleaning. But essentially, you went into the code base and said, okay, what where are we version, and let's make sure we're up to speed. You can do that anywhere. Yeah. You can point Q at you know security configurations. I mean, this is where this is killer. Yeah, we have started seeing customers, uh, there's this uh, insurance company that had Spring Boot applications and started upgrading them and they said they, they're doing it, I forget the exact number, I think it was about 36% faster yeah. than any other transformation effort that they ever, ha ever had. Yeah, uh, Dave and I were just joking on our podcast, I said, Dave, you know, this whole legacy modernization is happening. And he, we both, I go, you know, that's code word for, up, um, you know, putting a wrapper around it, to use old, old school language, but like just migrating and then making things run it used to be compatibility mode, means you have to write gateways to kind of make software work, but now you can actually integrate 
yeah. old code bases. So you got to kind of refresh them. So you can actually modernize legacy stuff yeah. and then integrate it into the modern. So you, know, you don't have to kill the old to bring in the new. Yeah, And, and, and you can thing. upgrade it more easily also. Yeah. Like if you have code sitting in one language and yeah. most of your developers are in another area, you can start doing that. And AI systems are pretty good at doing that and actually telling you what the old code did, the explainability part of it. It's one of the most commonly used capabilities we have is, tell me what this code does. You know, that's a great feature. In fact, one of the use cases I hear from a lot of the customers that you guys have and prospects and end user customers is, we're using AI to figure out what our AI strategy should be. Because a lot of the times they never had the opportunity to actually do run use case scenarios around planning. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's like, oh my God, I have all this data. Uh, and uh, first of all, what do we have? And, and then, then they get in and then they see uh, new, new products that come out of the code and or the data. So it's interesting. Um, um, valid call out there. So I want to ask you a question, uh, something on, on that's more product oriented. So uh, I want to get into the, the reasoning. But first I want to ask you, how has this developer uh, progression, this change over transformation changed the role of the product manager? Because you know I can see the product manager's game speeding up big time because now with the ability to kind of look at code, there's a lot more velocity going on on the product management side. So the, the product manager who has to do the normal you know, I won't say slow, but like methodical. This is our uh, <laughs> our product requirements, <laughs> PRDs, and the old school. I mean, you have to kind of get faster on that. Yeah. How is that changing? Because I can almost see the development going faster than the product specs. As a former product manager, <laughs> I uh, know that's why I asked. Uh, so the, you, you, uh, we started this uh, conversation by talking about PRFAQs. Yeah. Uh, I have this uh, saying in my org. I may have heard this from Matt Garman back in the day, which is, you should always have more PR facts than you can actually write software for. <laughs> I think it's very interesting, now you're reaching, you can maybe catch up with that, which means you have to write more PR facts and write them faster. Actually, our product managers are excited. Yeah. They're as excited as they can be, because they have a lot of ideas. Uh, in sometimes, some of those ideas can be prototyped without writing code. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you talked to anybody about Q Business recently, yeah. but within Q Business, we have this idea, uh, this thing called Q applications, Q apps. We also have Party Rock. Those are great prototyping tools. They're great for, hey, I have an idea. How do I convert this into a potential, uh, yeah. you know, design of something like that? Which is helping them iterate through yeah. their own ideas, taking customer feedback and being able to distill it down which then makes, helps them write better PR facts for our engineering organization. Do you have a automated PR FAQ uh, agent yet? I am sh uh, <laughs> I'm almost certain that somebody has taken Q apps and written one of those. Yeah. Uh, I, I you mean, know, yeah. I mean, I know for a fact that Party Rock and the tools you're mentioning have been used by Amazonians on the business side. I've heard people say, hey, I, I now know how to interface into the SQL databases. I don't have to, I just tell them what I want and as a result and it tells me what the SQL code is. Yeah. And so that you're seeing harmony between teams because the friction's coming away. Yeah. And so on the product management side, I think, you know, I mean, there's always backlog of things to work on, right? Yeah. I mean, to your point about Matt's comment about, you know, they should have everything second in prioritization. The bottleneck was coding and all the process. The time so now if you take that friction away and they could more time coding, yeah. then the product managers have to deal with velocity. It's like whitewater rafting. You're like going faster. Yeah, Pro product managers are itching yeah. to go even faster because yeah. we have all these tools now. Yeah. And as all of this gets comes together in the next few years, I, I, I see this as the creative juices of all the builders out there yeah. getting unleashed. And the job satisfaction would be higher. I mean, think about like just things Things are moving off the plate faster. Um, okay, great, so that's, that, that's a good, we're going to dig into that reInvent heavily, this whole productivity boom that's coming. I think it's going to be revolutionary. I think it's going to be something we've never seen before. New apps are going to come, and just these tools are just the beginning. All right, so the redesign behind the Q developer agent. Yeah. This has got reasoning, and take us through that. Cause I saw the blog post, was it a month ago or so? A uh, couple of months ago now, time yeah. flies. <laughs> it feels like yesterday. Okay, so, so what, take us through the redesign, because this is notable. Yeah, so some of it is just LLMs getting better mm -hmm. and allowing more things. Some of it is understanding uh, what our customers' expectations are. Some of it is, us, is our own under evolution of thinking around what an agent is. So one of the things that became very clear to us as the people started using the software development agent and using it in, in the wild, as I like to say, 
in anger, <laughs> uh, was that you were LLMs and foundation models in general were getting bigger context windows. They were getting more capabilities, and one of those interesting capabilities was the ability to use tools. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, there's a bunch of things we did with yeah. that agent, but one specific capability we added to the software development agent was building its own IDE. This is like a text editor, we call it text code, and what it allows the agent to do is the LLM can now open files, close files, uh, you know, almost like highlight text, delete text, add text. It's all doing that behind the scenes. It's the LLM that's doing it, not a human, but the LLM now has access to a text editor, which allows it to do these tasks, and like almost C code, you know, yeah. interact with it. And this whole idea of making tools available yeah. to uh, an LLM as part of the agent design, it, and this is one very specific example of something that we did, amongst other capabilities that made that agent get so much better. So for example, at the time that we wrote this blog post and published it, from the previous version on SW, SWE Bench Verified, we were 51% better. On SWE Full, we were 43% better. And we've continued to evolve the agent. We actually have newer versions now. Yeah. And I feel like, again, it's a flywheel. Yeah. More like it's getting at more accurate as the price performance of token costs and value, price forms of value is... It's a combination. It's uh, capabilities of the underlying foundation models. Mm -hmm. uh, it's capabilities being built in, like mm -hmm. uh, that allow some of these tool actions to take place. It is understanding what the system's design should be, but it's all being driven by the things that we see our customers doing. Mm -hmm. How are they interacting with this? What are the problems they're trying to solve that help us go back and say these are the... Help our scientists go think about, okay, yeah. This is what we need. This is the, these are the experiments we need to do. Uh, for example, let's build, give our LLM an access to a text editor, as an example. Talk about the fusion of data sets in, into the coding model, because I've always been saying for years on the cube, you know, you got horizontal scale clouds, great, but vertical specialization with the data is. We did a blog post this last week. We said Jamie Dimon is going to be Sam Altman's next competitor. You know, just inferring with you know the, the sensational headline was is that you know J.P. Morgan and J.P. Morgan Chase they have massive amounts of data, and that's their value. So they're going to probably end up coding against it. So there's this data as code. You got business as code. And DevOps kind of showed us a lot, right? Kind of showed us at that platform level that you know infrastructure code is a good thing. The yeah. APIs were great. Now you got Gen AI connecting in on top of the API. So you got this whole new wave coming in where people are going to want to jump in and start coding. So you're going to start to see smaller language models integrating with the large language models, foundational models, with computer vision. You know, computer vision is going to be massive. So you have, you know, yeah. all kinds of multimodal AI. But the little model's got to be have the proprietary IP behind it, intellectual property. The way the way to talk about it is actually the data that a company has, yeah. how it accesses, how you make it available to your foundation models, whether it's through uh, distillation, uh, whether it's through fine tuning, whether it's through RAG, all of them are methods and approaches, or even training your own model. Yeah. Uh, I think you will see companies use all of these approaches, where the where they will start with. Uh, knowledge bases in Bedrock, for example, which are data that only you have access to that's going to make your foundation model more effective in whatever application you're providing to your customers. Uh, we see that, uh, for example, with QDeveloper, we allow you to customize your responses based on your code base and your, co you know, which, so it's not a generalized response or generalized suggestion, <laughs> it's a yeah. suggestion that's driven by the design of your application and the packages that you use. Uh, you could, people might do fine tuning, they might take an existing model, uh, like we allow for something like Haiku, or for some of the other models that we have in uh, Bedrock. You can fine tune them and with your own data and make them more relevant to your customer base. Or you could go into SageMaker and train your own model. So I think you'll see the spectrum depending on the type of data you have, the type of application you're building, how well represented that type of uh, problem is in the foundation models. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, for example, uh, in the healthcare space in particular, you'll actually see lots of custom models because healthcare data is almost completely uh, yeah. I, in intellectual property for these pharmaceutical yeah. companies. And they get workflows that are well understood but yet complicated. Yeah. And bringing technology to that is just going to be much, yeah. takes all the friction out. Yeah. I mean, what was once a hassle, siloed systems just yeah. now. And the barrier to entry is going to keep going down and the ability to then deploy something like that yeah. 
to a to SageMaker or to Bedrock, uh, and to in a serverless way is is going to be. Yeah, very, you bring very up important. a good point that I think is bigger picture that I think is going to be the reinvent tone is impact. I mean, whether it's societal impact, better healthcare, or uh, climate change, or just making people more productive. I mean, one engineer that I talked to said, hey, I love all these new tools. I can, I can code more. I want to code. I said, what, what's been the big value? He goes, productivity. Well, he didn't say productivity. He said, more beer time. And what he <laughs> meant by more beer time was, I can drink more beer with my friends. And what he, what he was saying is, I get more leisure time, which was valuable to him. Some people yeah. want to be creative. Maybe they drink a few you know, uh, draft beers and go, hey, let's work on this project. So to your point about systems thinking, all that drudgery is gone, or not gone, or reduced, or almost eliminated. I've been at AWS for over 16 years, and one of the most fun parts about being yeah. here is the impact you've been able to have, whether it was yeah. when EC2 first came out, or when I was uh, working on containers, and now Gen AI is, I sit down with our customers and they have all these ideas on the things they can yeah. do, which they either had before but didn't have a mechanism yeah. or a way to get them done, or they just didn't have the time. Yeah. And that suddenly they have tools and, the t uh, and things that are unblocking them. Yeah. And if we could even do half of, if they can accomplish half of what they want to do. I, mean, I remember, really you happy. know, people, when people are indifferent, they acquiesce and if it's, if it's too much, as they say, if the juice isn't worth the squeeze, mm -hmm. they just abandon it or just, ah, ah yes. I, Actually, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, this is a predecessor to Party Rock and uh, Q apps that we had that was built internally. And the learnings from that eventually ended up in those public products. But we had a, bunch of data center technicians uh, who built an app which would probably never have been built because the, the, nobody's going to yeah. have a software team build one app yeah. and maintain it for a small, a small team of data center technicians. But what these folks did was they took all the documentation of their HVAC systems, they operated the HVAC systems yeah. in the data center, uploaded them to uh, this uh, AI system and they basically, with a couple of prompts, built this app that allowed them to enter error codes. The app would then tell, troubleshoot the error code and then provide them the solution based on the documentation. And they didn't, they're not developers. They went nuts, yeah. It's one of those things where something that may never have been done yeah. got done yeah. because of the fact that uh, there was this Gen AI based yeah. system, all built on bedrock. Well, that's the democratization. So let me, it's yeah. final question. That's why I said, you know, a guy like me hasn't coded in 20 plus years. Um, um, uh, and to get back at the coding, um, how do people get involved? Because you have a huge customer base mm -hmm. and loyal customer base that knows what the, knows the console, and some people just they've been provisioning resources in the cloud. But now you're starting to get a new kind of developer um, that wants to jump in. So like it might not be obvious to folks who haven't used Q. How do they yeah. start? How do you? Is it go to the console? Is it is there a, is there an onboarding mechanism? How yeah. would I? How, yeah. how would you get onto Q? Really it's, it's very easy. Uh, one way to do it is go to the aws.amazon.com, Amazon Q developer mm -hmm. uh, a detail page, yeah. and you can either download our plugins for Visual Studio or for IntelliJ, whichever your favorite IDE is, and you don't even need an Amazon account. You can use something called the Builder ID, which you can sign up for. It's like having your, it's like a social login, and it's free. And you can use Q Developer up to a point. I mean, you get you won't be you know it's be, be, it's, it, we limit the number of transformations you can do, etc. But you get all those capabilities. Uh, or if you have uh, if you have an AWS account and you log into the console, just log into the console and Q is available to you yeah. on the side. Uh, and if you buy Q Developer Pro licenses, mm -hmm. you can do all kinds of things with it. Uh, or, and even there, we have a very liberal free tier. So mm -hmm. You can so no, yeah. kick the tires. Oh, get, more than kick dirty. the tires. More than kick the tires. You can do meaningful work, and it's on, it's only when you know you have a per user license. When you have once you sign up a bunch inside an enterprise, yeah. You, yeah. You, the goal is get yeah. get and get people immersed into the tool. But to get going, you can all just start with the builder ID, go home, yeah. download it to your laptop, learn how to use these. I feel like any builder, whether they're a developer, an architect, a sysadmin, somebody who's just interested in building should go download Q and uh, yeah. learn what you can do with it. Deepak, great to see you. The, the next generation of environments here, I mean, it's going to be reduce the friction, reduce the steps it takes to do the, the, the mundane work or undifferentiated heavy lifting, get back to coding with co, co, 
co-assists, co, co, co co-workers, teammates, whatever you want to call it. And yeah. That's the future. Yeah. And uh, I'm very excited to see what our customers yeah. do as we keep evolving. What's going on at reInvent? What's the big plans? Uh, <laughs> Ten more days. <laughs> You're tight-lipped. I, the PR team does a good job. I can't get anything out of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I think you'll see a lot more about the kinds of things that we've talked about. Great stuff. Thanks for coming on. Always Good great to, to be here. Here yeah. in the home turf for AWS. It's a road game for theCUBE. We are here at the Amazon headquarters, Amazon Web Services headquarters. The building's called reInvent. The big conference is coming up. We'll be there with theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.